So we want to think about some of the determinants of market power in this uh, last video for chapter 12. And obviously one of the most important uh, determinants of market power is market structure, right? So we know in perfect competition that long run profits are zero, that price equals marginal cost. Whereas, you know, on the other end of the spectrum with a monopoly, price is going to be larger than marginal cost and they will have long run profits. Um, whereas, you know, in a Corneau oligopoly, we'll have uh, long run profits and price larger than marginal cost, but somewhere in between um, perfect competition and monopoly. Whereas in Bertrand, um, we get, you know, no market power with just two or more competitors. And so we want to think about some of these uh, determinants. Now, keeping in mind that there are going to be other factors in uh, price competition. So for one, we saw that product differentiation is a big um, determinant in dampening price competition, right? If firms can differentiate their products, either, you know, actually differentiate or just differentiate in uh, the minds of their consumers, that is going to decrease price competition. Um, we know that price competition is weaker when firms compete in output like Corneau as uh, opposed to price like Bertrand. Um, and then obviously if firms can form an effective and stable cartel, that will decrease price uh, competition. Although often what we'll see is a, a cartel will keep the price high and then somebody will cheat and then that will lead to um, you know extreme price competition a la Bertrand. Um, and another thing that's important to remember is that Price competition also depends on the presence of potential competition, right? So it's, you know, if you are a monopolist or an oligopoly and you're worried that um, keeping your price too high will attract uh, people into the market, then that can be a reason to decrease your price um, and uh, earn less profits than you otherwise would. So if we summarize this, you know, when entry barriers are present, um, so there's high concentration that will increase market power. If there are no potential entrants, that will increase market power. If products are differentiated, if they compete in output rather than price, if they can form an effective uh, cartel, um, and if they make strategic investments today in order to reduce costs uh, and or raise prices tomorrow, like we talked about at the end of uh, chapter 11. So. The common way to sort of test this throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s um, was to try to look at a system of equations with profits, um, advertising, capital expenditure, um, and then you know some other exogenous variables. Um, and so you would have a profit equation that would depend on concentration, that's your CR, advertising, that's A over S, um, so advertising divided by sales, capital over sales, that's K over S, uh, and then some exogenous variables, X1, X2, and X3. And you would solve the system of equations to try to sort of measure the effect that all of these variables had on each other. And um, these sort of results uh, came to sort of have a number of relationships that tended to be found over and over. Um, so one was that the effect of concentration on industry profits was actually pretty small and statistically weak, which is not what we would expect um, in, say, a Corneau type model. And we'll give an example of why that might be um, in the beer industry in, in just a minute. Um, so individual firm characteristics, right, such as relative cost advantage, have a substantial effect on industry profits. So if there is a, a cost leader, uh, they are going to be able to earn, you know, much higher profits than uh, less productive firms. Um, advertising spending and capital requirements tend to be positively correlated with industry profits. So we can think about those both in terms of barriers to entry, but also in terms of differentiating goods. Um, so advertising, you know, building brand and capital could be all about, you know, improving quality of the product as well. Uh, Expenditures on R&D, research and development, tend to be positively correlated with industry profits when concentration is low, uh, but the relationship may be weak or change sign when concentration is high. So in that way, you might think, all right, well, research and development um, are a way to earn positive profits when concentration is low, um, but not as much when concentration is high. 
Um, and then for firm profits, the effective concentration is generally negative or insignificant, but the effect of the firm's market share on profits is positive in some industries. And so I think the story there is often that, you know, the leading firms are the ones with those cost advantages. Um, and so they tend to have more market share and then more profits as well. So if we go back to beer, uh, beer seems to be the textbook's uh, favorite example. Um, here we have the, the HHI in the, the solid line and then the price cost margin in the dotted line. And you can see that there isn't really much relationship there, right? Maybe it increased a little bit after the mid 80s as, um, as the industry became very uh, concentrated. But the story that uh, Iwasaki et al. tell um, is that you know, these firms, as, as fewer and fewer firms came to dominate the market, uh, they engaged in um, you know, advertising and costs and, and price competition, right? So fierce price and advertising competition, uh, which is why their profits were so low in the sort of 70s and 80s. And it was only when you know, we got down to just very few firms in the industry, at least a few big firms, um, that, it, that profits started to increase again. Um, of course, once we get into the 90s, now that's when we start entering the sort of world of microbrews. And so while, you know, the big firms control most of the market, you couldn't really argue that, you know, consumers don't have choice, right? Because we do have a lot of choice in this uh, area. So if we think about the effect of, of concentration just on price as opposed to profit, um, you know, we have a few um, ways that we can look at this. So Goolsby and, and Syverson um, look at this and, and see that uh, when Southwest Airlines uh, enters a market, uh, airfares dropped by about 29%. So increased competition finds a, a decrease in price. Uh, Nother conducted a similar study in hospital services and found greater price and quality competition with less concentration. Um, and these other people found it in you know, banking, airlines, cement industries, et cetera. Um, and Barton and Sherman found that a horizontal merger, right? So merging into um, different areas within the industry led to a significant price increase. And so I think you know, that does support the idea that uh, prices tend to go up when competition tends to go down. Um, also, if we look at sort of intermarket data, uh, we can look at um, price concentration pairs in different geographic markets, right, where marginal cost is likely to be the same. So basically, you're looking at different areas and saying, all right, well, how many firms are competing in this market in this area versus how many firms are competing in the market in this area and how many firms are competing in the market in this area. Um, and so uh, Buss and Reisman found that, you know, one additional competitor caused uh, the median price to fall by 7.2 percent so that that's more evidence um that more firms less you know more less concentration leads to lower prices or more concentration leads to higher prices and then finally just to finish this off we have some more airline data and so quaka and and Shimokina conduct a case study on potential competition on airline prices, looking at the, the 1987 merger between US Air and Piedmont Airlines. Um, and so they found that with, you know, in markets where there was one or more potential competitors, um, they found that the presence of a potential entrant led to significantly lower fares. So airlines were keeping fares low in order to keep other airlines out of that market. Um, but when a merger, so when this merger between U.S. Air and Piedmont eliminated a potential competitor, airfares rose uh, by five or six percent, uh, five to six percent. So, you know, I think there is clear evidence that as, you know, more competitors are in a market, we get lower prices. Um, and that's that's generally true, although it's not it's not required. Right. We can still have pretty fierce price competition. Um, even in markets that have a few competitors, it really just depends on the market. 